Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Next Real. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. This is it, Andy. This is the yes, big one. This is the big one. This is what they've all been waiting for. <laughs> as, as have we. Oh, yeah. This is, of course, the uh, annual vacation challenge. Uh, we're going to take a little bit of time off and pre-record it. So we're, we're, we're surprising each other with a, a film for the other of us to watch that is in a specific 
category right that was determined some weeks ago that don't necessarily have to be guilty guilty pleasures no they don't that's the new twist this year yes all right so uh what is it uh, what was it that you had given me to choose from what was our category you had to pick a movie that had stop motion in it it could be a stop motion animation it could be a moment it could be the whole film Mm -hmm. So uh, as long as there was stop motion animation in it, it was uh, up for grabs. And it didn't have to be your favorite. I didn't specify that. It just had to be something with stop motion. Yes. And this was, as you know, predictably, this was really hard. (laughs) There's a lot of them. (laughs) It was it was really hard. Uh, There are there are a lot of them. I I really struggled uh, with coming up with the film that I thought would be, you know, as always, I think we we overthink these things. Perhaps. Yeah, probably. Perhaps. But that's part of the joy. It's right. That's right. So <laughs> I went I went way back. I went way back thinking, started way back. Let me say that. I did not end way back. Uh, I started with just researching where did where did stop motion, uh, you know, sort of start? Where did stop motion start? And, uh, you know, I, I watched a little bit of The Adventures of Prince Ahmed, 1926. Have you seen this one? I have not. That's great, though. Well, I didn't end there. So uh, okay. hold on to your <laughs> pants. Uh, that was uh, Prince Ahmed was, was arguably the first feature animation uh, or, Ever. And it was all done through, uh, you know, shadow puppets. And, and uh, it's really beautiful and kind of heartwarming. But it's also, you know, uh, it, it's, it's arcane a little bit and tough to watch. So I moved on. Uh, and I went into more of the uh, films, the kind of action films that we like. I looked at, at King Kong, uh, mm-hmm. 1933. One of my favorites as a kid was uh, Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. Uh, and, of course, oh, Jason yeah. and the Argonauts. I mean, those I thought really, you know, they're, they're super fun. Uh, but but I didn't really think that they captured the, the you know, the best of stop motion animation, as you can imagine. Um, so I, I looked at Tim Burton, of course, is kind of some legendary uh, uh, stop motion in some of Tim Burton's films. Uh, James and the Giant Peach was one that I, I thought happily about. I, I think a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, would, would jump right to Anomalisa. It's really recent, and uh, I almost did that. And I brought it up uh, and in a side conversation, and you really sort of poo-pooed it. I didn't poo-poo it. Yeah, you poo-pooed it a little bit. I didn't. I poo-pooed Synecdoche. Sinec- yeah, easy for you to say. <laughs> I know. Clearly, it isn't. You poo pooed it by uh, <laughs> by association. It was an associational poo poo, and uh, and so I moved on from that. And you know what? What really uh, brought me around? I can't wait. Is uh, Studio Leica. Ah. Uh, I think these guys are doing some absolutely incredible work in the field, and I really wanted to do something to tie in the one of the films I'm most anticipating uh, for 2016 for this summer, Kubo and the Two Strings. Obviously, oh, yeah. I'm, we're not doing that one because it's not out yet. Uh, but I thought, what a great way to warm up to some incredible innovation in stop motion by doing 2012's Paranorman, directed by Chris Butler and Sam Fell. I love that idea. <laughs> it's such a great movie, and I definitely can't wait to talk about that one. I think this one's going to be really great. And I went back to watch some of the uh, the making of and uh, just Angry Aggie, the work that goes into Angry Aggie we could talk about as a whole show, that they have a stop-motion character that is so beautifully augmented by hand-drawn animation and CGI and lasers <laughs> that I feel like we, we really need to talk uh, about this movie. So that's that's what I'm picking. I can't wait. Oh, I just love it. I think that's going to be so much fun. They, uh, You're right. That studio does just some amazing, amazing work. And uh, I definitely am looking forward to Kubo and talking about this one. I, I have to ask you, though, when you came up with this category for me, uh, what did you th- what were you thinking of? Did you have a movie in mind? Like, you know, or I a didn't. Set of movies? I didn't. I was really kind of, uh, I mean, I, I just love stop motion. I think there's something really magical about it. And I think I had just rewatched Mysterious Island, mm-hmm. which is kind of one of my uh, my uh, pleasures from a, uh, being a child watching that movie with all the giant animals. Mm-hmm. And I just love, uh, you know, what uh, Ray Harryhausen brings to the table. 
um, in his uh, stop motion. And so, um, you know, I just I think it's a really interesting art form. And now that CG is so popular, um, it you don't see as much of the stop motion. And I'm glad that Leica still uh, animates that way for their films. But um, yeah, there's just you don't get like that Ray Harryhausen kind of stuff in a movie anymore. So I, you know, I find it really fascinating to watch and I, I really kind of was happy with anything. So, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have anything specific in mind and I think this is a great choice. Excellent. Glad to hear it. All right. Uh, what's yours? Now you gave me, uh, my favorite end of days dystopian post-apocalyptic comedy. <laughs> I, I did. Now that was uh, it's tricky because looking for the comedies in that <laughs> that world, uh, it's it's not overflowing. But uh, I did end up finding some some good options, and it's tricky because you know you are my favorite, and um, you know I kind of am going with one that's I I, I think it counts. <laughs> <laughs> are you you need to get judges ruling on it then? Well, it definitely uh, it definitely ends with the apocalypse. The apocalypse <laughs> is featured in the film. <laughs> okay. So I figured that is end of days. All right. But All right. but I figured I would I would kind of do a countdown for you looking at at some of my favorites. Excellent. Uh, of what I considered uh you know end of days comedies. So at number 5 and and really I honestly could go with any of these films. I think that they're all wonderful films and would be really fun to talk about. Okay. And number five, for some reason, I feel like this is probably the one that you are thinking that I would pick. <laughs> but I'm not sure. Uh, it's right. actually This is the End. That's exactly the one I thought you were going to pick. <laughs> let me let me clarify. I don't think that... I, I just remember talking about it that I was so surprised when you told me that you saw it and you'd had, I don't know if it was vodka tonics, a number of vodka tonics before you drink, and you uh, actually found yourself really laughing at it. So I went and saw it, and I found it really funny, too. Uh, and so that's, oh, yeah. I don't know that I wanted you to pick it, but I do know that that's the film that helped me define the category. Let's say that. Excellent. Excellent. Well, that definitely fits. Okay. Because <laughs> it's very funny, <laughs> and it is about the end of the world. Uh, so that's number five. Number four of my favorites would be Zombieland. Oh, yes. It's terrific. Another really funny one and one of the best Bill Murray moments in a film. Truly. <laughs> Truly. Uh, number three is Wally. Oh, which yeah. It's kind of more of an adventure story, but I figured, you know, there's a lot, of, there's enough comedy in there where I felt, you know, you can almost say that with any kind of Pixar film that there's an awful lot of comedy in it still. Mm -hmm. So I, I put that on the list at number three. Uh, number two. Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, <laughs> which there's nothing uh, more interesting than talking about the end of the world by giant food landing on it and destroying everything. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> which I really love. But my number one, which I think is going to be really fun to talk about, and I hope that you think it fits the category, <laughs> is Dr. Strangelove, How I Learned to Stop Worrying uh and Love the Bomb. <laughs> Well, okay. A, yes, it fits the category. B, I should have seen this coming a mile away. You have been talking about, hinting about Dr. Strangelove for weeks. I have. It keeps coming up. Well, it's not my fault Fritz Lang pulled from it. Or, oh, I mean, my goodness. Kubrick pulled from Fritz Lang. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is a great... It's another one that it's, I'm, I am really surprised we haven't done yet. I think that's a great, great choice. And it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's so funny. And yeah, it ends with uh, global annihilation. Yeah, uh, you you really can't. Yeah, you can't be any more cookie cutter, right? Apocalypse comedy than Doctor Strange Love. That's perfect. Well done, Andy. This was fun. I can't wait to talk about these movies. Oh, it's going to be a great pairing. So when are we doing this? Uh, it's coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, it is. After our listener's choice episode, when we're talking about The Great Escape, then we kick right in with uh, yours, Paranorman, and then mine, Dr. Strangelove. Between then and now, I think we should tell the people where we're from. Where are we from? This is The Next Reel, everybody, on Rashpixel.fm. I'm Pete Wright, and that right over there is handsome Andy Nelson. Hello, hello. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, the last of our Fritz Lang celebration with the 1944 thriller Ministry of Fear. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the show and your favorite podcast app or join us over on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter or Facebook at The Next Reel. 
And if you've ever done time in an asylum, then you're probably in the mood for cake. And a healthy slice of the next reel's Instagram hashtag pony prize hashtag guess the movie challenge. And with that, let's sit in on Mrs. Belaine's seance to see if we can reach out to Games Master Stephen Smart and find out who won this week. Hey guys, this week's movie was Love Story from 1970, directed by Arthur Hiller and starring Ryan O'Neill and Ali McGraw. And this week's winner was at Cotton Science. So congrats, you are entered once again into the 2016 Pony Prize hat. As always, a new challenge starts on Monday, so thanks guys and see you later. We got an email. We did, we did, yes we did. Let's talk about it. Steve Cotton Science sent a note in about uh, watching Ninochka, playing catch up on some of the movies that we've talked about. Uh, That was from our 1939 series. And he loved it, gave it 8 out of 10, which is fantastic. And I have to say, Steve, your email actually uh, made me want to go revisit the film. I think that uh, it might be worth a revisit and just kind of see if I can uh, uh, dig a little deeper with this movie and, uh, and... because I think I was kind of like fair to middling on it when yeah. I watched it. But now I'm like, you know, I think there might be more uh, worth catching in it. And so I think I may give that one another go. So thanks for sending us the note. Yes, thank you very much for writing in. We sure appreciate that. We got some follow-up uh, with the Blot Spot this week on Manhunt. Ben writes in, You guys nailed all the character issues that I had with Manhunt, but I didn't have as many problems with the story. I thought it worked pretty well, and with some different casting decisions, it could have been a classic on par with the other Lang, Lang movies we've watched. While the opening scene was tense and thrilling, I thought the scene in the cave towards the end was equally good. And I just loved how the relentless pursuit of the Nazis turned Thorndike into exactly what they thought he was at the beginning your rank 228 my rank 91 oh man he's loving this lang series i think that this one uh I, this one did not sway me although i do agree with that very last line how the nazis pursuit turns thorndike into exactly what they thought he was at the beginning i uh i agree i think that twist is really great and that that uh, first shot last shot um really cements that perspective but everything in between it's just too much annoying in there for me. You know, I I don't know. I mean, there's some annoying in there. But the thing about Lang films that I'm really getting is, man, I just find them so watchable, regardless of whether I, I don't like it as much or whether I really love it. I mean, I just, I just find them watchable. So this is definitely something I could come back and watch again. I don't know if I'm going to actively try to, but I think I very easily could if it happened to be playing. A desert island. It's all you've got. You would put it on where I might uh, go swimming. That's right. All right. <laughs> Andy, it's time. Let's do trailers. What a weird thing for me to wake up one morning and think, hey, I'm going to do like a horror thriller as my trailer. (laughs) I love that. I chose The Wailing this week, Andy. Uh, This is a a stranger uh, from Japan arrives in a little village in Korea and soon after that, a mysterious sickness starts spreading through the village. Uh, a policeman gets drawn in, and it becomes a great mystery uh, in order to save his daughter. Uh, this is from director Hong Jin Na. Uh, he wrote and directed the film. Stars Jun Kunimura, uh, Chong Min Huang, and Wu Hee Chun. Um, I. I found myself sort of captivated by this. I granted this was a little bit of a of a, a, a light week on trailers. There, there were, uh, wasn't a whole lot that I was excited about uh, choosing from, but uh, but this one I, I felt was really um, really compelling visuals. It was it gave me that sort of the the forest part that I really like. Um, you know, the lots of of great haunting bird visuals uh and and i do like the the stranger in a strange land vibe i think it could be uh it, it could be an interesting thing for me i don't see a lot of these movies but i i don't speak the language and maybe that that's that next level of barrier that uh will will allow me to see it and not get too freaked out yeah i uh this looks there's something really interesting about this it actually gave me kind of the vibe the witch had yeah, you know, yeah it, it yeah. felt it felt very kind of raw and visceral, and uh, there's something really unnerving about the whole thing. I was uh, pretty intrigued. I don't know if I fully got much out of the trailer, but other than just a really creepy vibe and a guy trying to find his daughter. But um, yeah, this is, uh, you know, there's something really interesting about Korean horror films, and I think that would be an interesting series to do down the line at some point, because I know you, uh, you love horror films. 
I'm uh, working things. on it. I'm working <laughs> so, on it. So why not start with some wacky Korean ones? Right, right. Um, so, um, yeah, this is definitely something I definitely want to check out. So I look forward to seeing this one. Well, you know, you can see it right now, apparently. If you check your local theaters, I think it opened this weekend. I have a feeling it'll probably be local local in uh, L.A. and New York. Yeah, yeah. So That's, if you're if you're your tiny local local down the street neighborhood LA movie house, that's where yes. you should go. Uh, what's yours? Well, I mine's a little teaser. Did you see the animated film that came out? Uh, it was nominated for an Oscar a few years ago. A Cat in Paris. No, really, uh, really cool kind of uh, animated film. Um, a lot of fun. I watched that with the kids. Um, it was it was one of those years where. There were a lot of films that, you know, that got nominated for Best Animated Feature that were foreign or really quirky. And I just remember looking at the lineup and going, I don't, I don't think I've heard of any of these except for, um, I don't know, it might have been the year that Rango came out or something like that. Um, but A Cat in Paris was just a really cool movie. Uh, the French filmmakers Jean-Luc Felicioli and Alain Gagnol uh, directed that one and are doing this follow-up called Phantom Boy which looks to be like a really fun, uh, just kind of an interesting film. Uh, the story is about a super-powered boy um, who helps a wheel ba- wheelchair-bound policeman in his attempt to bring down a mob kingpin. Um, this boy, it looks like, it's almost like he can just, uh, you know, project himself out of his body and kind of go go exploring to find things and, you know, uh, evidence and uh, bad guys and things. Um, it's this interesting teaser that, uh, I don't know, there's not a whole lot to it because it is just teasing, but it gives me just enough of the story where I really want to see more of it. I want to get more into this world because it just looks, uh, it looks so fantastic. Um, they, I guess they were inspired by classic gangster stories of the forties and fifties and this little hospitalized boy, uh, you know, he kind of, yeah, he kind of floats around, but he, it, there's this whole crime element going on in New York City, and he's trying to kind of help them. Um, the voice talents of Edouard Bayer, Jean-Pierre Marielli, and Audrey Tatou, one of my favorites, um, mm-hmm. are all in it, along with uh, Jackie Beroyer. Um, hopefully I'm saying some of those names properly. <laughs> <But, laughs> oh, no, don't worry. You're uh, not. No, yeah. no. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> It's worth a shot. But uh, it it just has a, a, you know, I really appreciate Pixar films and Walt Disney. You know, I just love all of those sorts of things. And what all the other studios are doing with all their CG films are just beautiful. But, um, you know, we've talked about Hayao Miyazaki on the show before. And there's something really um, just kind of touching about watching a film that's just hand-drawn 2D animation. I still really love it. This is one of those films, and uh, just the look and the story just looks like something that is so right up my alley. So very excited. What what do you think? Uh, you know, it just reminds me of the same feeling I get when I crack open The Little Prince, you know? I mean, it's, oh, yeah. it's that that same sort of innocent style um, that that I I really do. I, I'm with you. I, I find it really uh, beautiful and simple. And, and there's something about a narrow color gamut, you know, uh, that that uh, I, I think just feels good. It's kind of the same thing I like about um, Futurama, you know? Like, everything is so vibrant and so primary uh, that, that it feels just... Uh, satisfying visually and and much more kind of approachable than some of the more um you know advanced cg animated features so yep absolutely when's it when's it hit you know this is one of those movies where it doesn't have much in the way of uh release information yet which is unfortunate it's been playing in the festival circuit since uh toronto last fall and it's still kind of in the festival circuit um playing um well i guess i guess it uh had uh, festival listings through the end of May at Seattle International Film Festival. They don't have any release dates for it yet, which is probably why, you know, all we have so far is just a teaser. Uh, I'm hoping that they're going to get some more information out soon, though, because it looks cool, and I definitely want to see this one. I do, too. Let's do it. <laughs> oh, let's. Oh, Andy, Mr. Travers is quite put out. <laughs> This is the Ministry of Fear, a network of terror that lays bare the secrets locked in every man's mind, using strange hypnotic torture, relentless, cunning, tangling their quarry in a web of horror until he reaches the brink of madness. Who speaks? 
Who said that? Don't break the circle. Don't break the Who told you that? Ah! Turn on the lights. Turn on the lights. Turn on the lights. Turn on the lights. Light. 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 Cost. Look at cost. There is no escape from the Ministry of Fear, where menace lurks behind every shadow, where a blind man sees and strikes in the night. <laughs> Ministry of Fear, starring Ray Milland as a man obsessed by murder, with Marjorie Reynolds as his only hope through a nightmare of never-ending flight. Willie asked me if I was falling in love with you. And? I said... Yes. Can I tell you? Can I tell you a funny thing about Ministry of Fear, Andy? This is the first time this has happened to me. I'm curious uh, what it is. You watched the wrong movie. <laughs> well, related. Okay. Uh, I I actually couldn't find it uh, anywhere useful uh, oh. to stream except YouTube. I oh. watched the whole thing on YouTube. Now, I know there are movies posted on YouTube, and that's all well and good, uh, but I found it amusing that this was the first time I had actually, after doing the show for like five years, this is the first time that I've actually run to YouTube and found a film and was able to watch a crisp, clean, clear um, uh, uh, version of it. Was it one you had to pay for on YouTube? No, or was it... it was not. <laughs> There's a oh. link to it. It's in the show notes. I don't know how useful that's going to be, but if you haven't seen it... You can see Ministry of Fear, 1944, Fritz Lang's film written by Seton Miller, based on the novel by Graham Greene, starring Ray Milland, Marjorie Reynolds, Carl Esmond, and more, right there on YouTube. How'd you, uh, you, I assume, did the Criterion uh, LaserDisc version? <laughs> Not quite the LaserDisc, Pete. <laughs> Not quite the LaserDisc. Still funny. No, yeah, yeah, you just love that. No, yes, I, I actually have the Blu-ray of this one. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty movie. So you had seen this one uh, many times. Uh, no, not many times. I had seen it. All right. But I, not many times. But this I was, do enjoy this one. If you recall, last week, the, this was a new one to me. I had not seen it. And you uh, you actually uh, laid a wager of what I would think of it. I did. I, uh, yeah. my, uh, my life savings. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's not going to get you to Poughkeepsie. Oh. Uh, I will. Uh, I can't wait to reveal uh, my star rating for this film. This, this should be very exciting. That, that'll come at the end of the show. It's what we call a teaser. Oh. In the business, yeah. Uh, I what? It, how did it hit you uh, on this viewing of Ministry of Fear by the Fritz Lang, and and in particular, uh, how does it hit you at the end of our series after uh, given what we've already, how far we've come with Fritz? You know, it's uh, it's interesting. I really do enjoy watching this movie. I think it's a fun one to watch. Um, it's it's interesting because the, it does have some story problems, like all of the films that we've discussed. But there's something about this one that uh, I don't know. I guess I find them easier to gloss over because it feels like. Um, I I don't want to say less of a serious film, but no, I think that's know, absolutely fair. Well, yeah, a, a lot of people call this kind of a, a minor work in Lang's filmography. I don't know if minor is right, but it just doesn't feel like he's he's pushing to do something uh, that different. I mean, it is kind of an anti-Nazi film, but at the same time, is it really? <laughs> you know, it's not much of an anti-Nazi film. If anything, this feels the most Hitchcockian of the films that we've discussed and of the films I've seen of Fritz Lang's. Um, it feels, you know, it's a man who, who's in the wrong place at the wrong time, gets mistaken for somebody else, and he's thrust into this world of Nazi spies and murder. And I enjoy watching Ray Milland go through this struggle of trying to figure out what the heck is going on here. Um, and it's just fun. I mean, I have just a... a a wild time watching this movie. It's just lots of fun. Yeah, I'm not going to say that this film is is inconsequential. Uh, it is, but it it is it's simple fun. I, I'm with you. I enjoy it. It hides so much of the uh, sort of anti Nazi um, uh, rhetoric that we have seen in Fritz's other films. Uh, it, it hides so much of those beneath just you know, these dark symbols that, that we can kind of dissect, but it's generally a, a muted uh, political story compared to what we've already seen, uh, and it, especially coming from where we were last week with Manhunt. I, I think that it is the one that seems most sort of frivolous in its use of, of you know, mystery and thrill, and uh, it, but it, it does so in a, a particularly pleasant style, uh, the, the stylistic sensibility, starting from the very first uh, sequence where we meet our protagonist uh, waiting to be, uh, you know, uh, released from his 
time at an asylum. I can't think of another film off the top of my head that begins with such a good-natured uh, asylum uh, patient. <laughs> <laughs> ready to, or, ready or to take on the world or a doctor. <laughs> right, right. I mean, this it was a very strange uh, sort of, um, uh, I, I don't know, I, it, very strange sensibility uh, opening the film. But I, I have to say, I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was, uh, it, it was fun. And I would, I would probably watch it again. And that, that I think, given some of these films, it says a lot. Yeah, I think it does. I, I think it definitely does. I think there is something, um, I mean, I there were um, issues that Lang had trying to get this film made. I shouldn't say trying to get this film made. Uh, it was easy to get the film made, but um, trying to get the film made that he wanted to make was the was the difficult challenge yeah. that he had here. He wasn't happy with this film. Uh, Graham Greene didn't like this film, but um, it was the film that the producer Seton Miller, who also wrote the screenplay, um, really pushed to get made and and got it made the way that he wanted it to be made and. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I think that I enjoy that. It does, uh, it still feels, uh, Langian. I still see some of the elements from him in this film. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think frivolous is kind of a nice word. It just feels like it's, it's a little more fun and maybe Lang, uh, resented having to work with a producer who is really pushing to kind of keep him to the script and not letting him change things around and all that sort of stuff. Um, that might be the cause of him kind of disliking his experience with this film and the film itself. But I don't know. I mean, I still feel it has a lot of his touches in it. And I I mean, yeah, in general, I do like this movie. I, you know, you mentioned Hitchcockian, and, and I found that really fascinating because I agree with you. And as I was watching the film, I thought, you know, this this really is, we're, we're kind of diving right into that Hitchcock zone. And and then I picked up uh, that Green, in, you know, author of the, the book, Graham Green, uh, was at... For some time in his life, he was a film critic, and he particularly uh, disliked Hitchcock uh, and uh, wrote him off as a silly, harmless clown, he said. His films consist of a series of small, amusing, melodramatic situations, the murderer's button dropped on a baccarat board, the strangled organist's hands prolonging in the notes in an empty church, the fugitive hiding in the bell tower when the bells begin to swing. Very perfunctorily, he builds up to these tricky situations, paying no attention on the way to inconsistencies, loose ends, psychological absurdities, and then drops them. They mean nothing. They lead to nothing. This is Green on Hitchcock. I watch this film, Ministry of Fear, and I think this is Lang, his hand forced to deliver essentially Hitchcock, and I am not surprised at at how both Lang and Green would walk away from the experience feeling uh, fairly negative to it. Uh, and yet it also is what satisfies that sort of saccharine taste for me. Like it's it's a sweet, fun, kind of noirish thriller with lots of high contrast black and white that, that is appealing. It's a funny one. And, uh, you know, Seton Miller, when he adapted Graham Greene's novel, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I know he was very much a Paramount man. Um, he had really worked as a screenwriter. I mean, he'd written, you know, big things like The Adventures of Robin Hood. He did a lot of projects with Howard Hawks. I mean, he's kind of a, you know, he was a, a key writer of the time. Um, but uh, he was kind of branching out as a producer. And this was, I think, his first uh, thing that he produced. And he kind of showed Lang that, you know, a producer could control things. And, uh, you know, a producer should control things. I mean, I know Lang was kind of used to not having to deal with that. But, I, you know, I don't know. I think there's something interesting about this producer who really pushed Lang to uh, stick with the script and stick with the schedule and stick with the budget. Lang did go over budget and schedule a little bit. But, I mean, for the most part, this is the script that uh, that Miller wanted. He cut out a lot of the, the Nazi stuff in the story. I think he was pushing for something that was a little more saccharine and easier for people to watch. He got rid of Nazi armbands and... You know, the, you know, there's the giant fireplaces in, on the wall that we had and the, with the Nazi flags over them, like in uh, uh, Manhunt. You know, none of that stuff is in here. Uh, you know, we've got uh, Willie, who is apparently a Nazi spy and kind of a ring of these Nazis. But it's like, I mean, how involved is is uh, Mrs. Uh, Belaine? I mean, you know, she's kind of in on it, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. But uh, along with everybody else at the seance, but but 
are they like it's it's like how involved are they are they really nazis are they just involved in other nefarious activities you know they don't call the cops they fake that whole thing but are they nazis i don't know i mean i think I think Willie might be the only one who kind of is admitted as a Nazi. Well, and and my sense is the book actually had a much clearer uh, delineation of who was a Nazi and who wasn't, and so much of that was sanitized for the the you know presentation of the film, uh, and and left I think probably intentionally unclear. My my feeling is that it was left unclear uh, as you know as, as a. A, a nod to Lang or a nod by Lang that there is more going on here than uh, he is, you know, allowed to put in the film more explicitly. Um, so much of this film really is a story of the loss of innocence. You know, it's all about this this character released from the asylum, a different man. He is he is you know less innocent than he was going in. A loss of innocence of Britain a, as a nation at war, and and I think you know all of these issues about sort of the complexities of having this virus of Nazism invade this city um, is is left uh, very much for us to interpret ourselves. The one thing I can't believe you didn't, you know, yell out from the top of the mountain, there was no Nazi monologuing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Today, <laughs> Europe, tomorrow, the world. Oh, absolutely. Uh, he, Willie was all set up for it, too. He was absolutely <laughs> uh, set up for it. Nobody was killed in the, the only bombing that we see, the Nazi, the Germans bombing London. The only time we see it is they bomb an essentially empty film or an empty field right and they uh, destroy like the factory building right? uh, yes they, <laughs> there's, a hut. there's nothing there <laughs> the hut. Uh, and and so uh, i i think that's I, one critic i read said that that essentially nazism in this film is reduced to MacGuffin status yes and i think that is a really interesting perspective that it, it doesn't necessarily matter it is a political stance that you you're forced to think about because of the weight that it has in the name itself but in in effect it only allows us to move to the next plot point yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's pretty clear that Miller really wanted to just make a thriller here. I mean, the ending of the book had a, a lot of change or a lot of specific things happening uh, that he kind of rewrote in uh, in the uh, screenplay that I think uh, Lang wasn't happy with and obviously Graham wasn't happy with either. Um, here's a little uh, note about the ending. Neil's trip to a hospital after the book bomb uh, gives him amnesia. The ending is the biggest change. Um, so he ha- gets amnesia, and then he has to f- he he flees this hospital trying to figure out that these Nazis are pursuing him. His love interest Anna Hilfa, Carla in the film, appears uh, to be uninvolved in her brother's spy activities. In the novel, she does not shoot her brother dead, and there is no rooftop shootout with Nazi agents. Her brother Willie Hilfa, armed with a gun with a single bullet, commits suicide in a railway station lavatory when he cannot escape. Anna must forever fear exposure as a spy, just as Roe, or Neil, fears exposure as a murderer. They go on together, lovers, but hardly the happy and carefree couple portrayed in the film. They had to tread carefully for a lifetime, never speak without thinking twice. They would never know what it was not to be afraid of being found out. That, not the spy pursuit of the film, is at the heart of Graham Greene's novel. So it was a totally different... It was it, like the whole message of the book was different. It was all about this, you know, uh, being afraid to be uh, discovered sort of thing and not knowing who to trust. Um, it makes for a very interesting feel. And it's interesting that uh, that Miller kind of chopped all that out and, and gave us uh, this really kind of forced ending about the two of them just driving along the coast after they you know have this nazi shootout as they're talking about wedding cake i mean <laughs> it it's, it's awful it's so inconsequential it's so and painful nonsensical yeah it's very frustrating so i think graham green is a fascinating author and his experience says a lot about um you know how he comes to some of the weightiness of his stories he was a, a journalist and a teacher for a while and he traveled a lot and his life is is really the subject of I, I think a fascinating movie in itself. His sister Elizabeth recruited him to MI6 uh, to be a spy during World War II. She stationed him in Sierra Leone and had him working directly for Kim Philby. Does Kim Philby ring a bell to you, Andy? No. He should. He should, should he? Andy. This is the same Kim Philby who was later revealed to be a Soviet double agent in real life, and he has been in the media for decades. Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy? Yes, that's based on Kim Philby. Archibald Cummings? 
The Good Shepherd, yes, that is also Kim Philby. He was also the central characterization of Harry Lyman in, in uh, Graham Greene's screenplay that he wrote for The Third Man, this time Philby played by Orson Welles. Uh, fascinating, fascinating history that that causes or that allows Greene to write a, a much more complex story of espionage uh, that I, I think, um, you know, Miller sanitized to the point of being, you know, substantially less impactful. But like we said, less impactful, but still there's something lighter and uh, saccharine about it that still makes it really enjoyable. And I agree. Yes. It puts it in a place where you have these story logic problems like cost getting murdered at the seance. Like, how do they figure out, hey, this guy is here. Let's fake a murder and make it look like it's him. Like, there's no conversation. How does this group of people determine that this is what they need to do to pin this murder on this guy? Like, it's it's so illogical. But it's like, I don't know. I, I find it so easy to dismiss that in this particular film. No, I, I agree. I, I Strangely, it is a film with its own sort of sense of intrinsic charisma. And I I am drawn to it in that way. It is, it's almost like it, it satisfies the need in me to be exposed to all of the stereotypes at once of espionage noir thrillers. And I get them, and I chew on them a little bit and then move on. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk to uh, uh, specifically about uh, Lang's role as director. Now, you mentioned that there was, you know, there was a contract issue with Seton uh, Miller, and so Lang did not get the control that he usually gets. Well, he said that he usually gets that control, but people now, you know, argue, did he ever really get that control or does he just kind of say that? Um, yes, he had, uh, from back in 1938, he had a deal with Paramount. He um, um, still owed them a film, and uh, this was kind of the film that ended up um, satisfying that deal. Um, he had apparently read the script b- like a while ago. After the probably after the book was written, and then when he reread it when he signed this deal, he said he was terribly shocked at how it had worsened since he first read it, and he wanted out. But Paramount wouldn't cancel his contract. Now people have gone back and actually looked at the scripts that were available, and they don't think that there's actually any difference from the script that he first read <laughs> to the one that he read. They they think that he was just unhappy with the fact that Miller uh, was going to kind of be controlling this project and was trying to find a way out of it. And of course, they wouldn't let him out because he did owe them a film. And so he just kind of, he went into this film from the beginning kind of hating it. I mean, he hated the fact that Paramount, it was all Paramount players, like the cast and crew. Uh, Ray Moland was a a Paramount guy and, and he was already cast in the film. Um, same with Marjorie Reynolds. They had uh, they had kind of already, or they were pushing her, and they wanted her in it. And and same with a, a lot of the crew, like the the DP um, Henry Sharp. And so he went into this project kind of suffering with with all these things that they were making him do. So I think he just kind of dismissed it largely, which is too bad. I mean, because it still feels very Langian. You know, there's a lot of interesting motifs that he has in here, a lot of the kind of the circles and clocks that he puts in his films. You know, we've got the clock and the horoscope signs and the cake and the seance. And when the bomb goes off, it makes a big circle in the ground. And, and everything is kind of this circular thing and, and the, the way that time is portrayed. And then there's suicides in here. Um, there's so many hands in the film. Well, and don't forget the the the, the incredibly Langian old cake in a tree trick. <laughs> right, we've I seen mean, that in every one of these films. It's 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 hard to spot. <laughs> it, this may be the the most obvious, but cake in a tree is a, a particularly Langian trope. I, I don't think it was in the tree. I think it was at the top of the. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the strut of the remains of the building where the bird had built its nest. <laughs> That's right. Well, there was so, a bird. Cake yes, and a bird. A bird and bird yeah. a it's cake. Like, <laughs> it's like the bird had flown it up there to make its nest out of it. I didn't quite understand like how the, the bird tri- triggered his thought. Oh, it must be up It there. must be up in this old burnout <laughs> building where that bird is. Oh, so funny. Yes, that was uh, ridiculous. I, I, I think, you know, there's a quote, uh, Joe McElhaney, who is a... a, a, a a critic, somebody who's written uh, books about Lang, said, for Lang, characters seem to begin when the film begins and end when the film ends. You know, I was thinking about that, and I was like, you know, it does kind of feel like it fits, especially in this film with these characters in this world. They just feel like they're here to satisfy this story. 
You know, they don't yeah. feel like there's there's much more outside of it. And I think that works in this particular case. Let's talk first shot, last shot. Yes. First shot is the, uh, we're on the clock. Clock is about to strike six, and we are waiting in a, uh, a high contrast darkened room. Uh, and we, uh, the the clock is ticking away, and we're we're pulling back off of it. Uh, and the last shot, as we've already mentioned, is driving down the coastal road, discussing the wedding cake. Yeah, this is a tricky one to talk last shot because I don't think that's the last shot that uh, that um, Lang would have liked to no. have in the film. I'm not sure what his last shot would have been, but I, you know, the first shot does say so much about this story. You've got. Um, this clock that is just ticking, ticking, ticking away, and we slowly pull back from it, and we have this dark room, and we just see this this silhouette of this figure sitting there, and it's there's something um, mysterious about what's going on here. There's something um, I don't know. It makes you a little anxious. It gives you an interesting feel for the film that is being set up here. I I agree, and I you know I find any time we we start on in a room in that really um that beautiful sort of door bright door light you know otherwise the room is dark i think it immediately gives us a sense of just an unnerving sense of of foreboding uh because you know why is a dude in a suit sitting in a darkened room uh and so it just makes you question everything that comes after it i think it sets it up well um but i'm i'm with you the last shot doesn't give us a symbolic pairing in a way that that i would have hoped no, it it really doesn't. It's I mean, it's, you know, I, I guess if you want to look at it in any particular way to kind of find any sense of the, the motion of the story between these two shots, it's the sense that this guy is kind of lost in the darkness in the beginning of the film. And, you know, he's he wants to get out and he's, you know, trying to find his way out of it. And at the end of it, you know, he has found his way out. I mean, it's, you know, I don't know. It's not very impressive or exciting, but... <laughs> But if, if that's well, the way you got to do it with uh, with a forced ending, then I guess that's the way you got to do it. You know, it's a reach that leads us right into Ray Melanda's Stephen Neal, our, our uh, primary char- our main character. Uh, you've already mentioned there was a name change uh, from the book. I-, I don't necessarily know that that matters in particular. Um, it- it's curious. I-, I don't know why they they changed a couple of names for seemingly no reason. Plus, they dropped the the on the title. Yes. I, I, it's just like weird little changes, and I don't know, like, what was uh, Miller's logic when he wrote it? Right, right. Um, the, the main problem, actually, with any performance in the film, I actually found myself not having a, much of a trouble with anybody in the film, except for Ray Land as Stephen Neal. I found that he, I, I don't think he really sold it for me as a guy who is just released from an asylum. He has a fantastically joyful look on his face through about the entire film. <laughs> right? We discover through little bits and pieces that he actually, um, he murdered his wife. It was a mercy killing. Uh, in the book, apparently it was not a mercy killing. It was him, you know, murdering his wife. Uh, but in, in the movie, it's set up as a mercy killing. He, he has uh, apparently enormous guilt. I never see that guilt. This is a performance that doesn't really sell for me. His, uh, you know, his space in the film. So when you talk about, you know, characters that come to serve the, their purpose in the film and then they don't exist beyond that, his is the only one in this film that doesn't actually meet that bar. I, I can see that. Um, you know, this is no Lost Weekend for <laughs> for Ray Milland, you know. Right. It's, it's not the film that we're going to be watching for his performance. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I can agree with that. I, I, I don't think he bothered me too much. I think I just kind of went along with it. Um, but now that you say that, I'm like, yeah, you know, you're pretty right. You're right on the money with it. <laughs> yeah, again, that doesn't necessarily impact my feeling about the film because I still, I had fun watching it again. I will see it again. Uh, but I am i didn't like him. And that's disappointing because he's the one you're looking at for most of the film. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard when you... Uh, when uh, you're kind of dealing with an actor you don't want, I am wondering if Lang had issues uh, directing Milan. I mean, I didn't hear any stories about that. So, um, it, who? Any, do you want to say anything else about Ray, or, or uh, shall we move on to Marjorie Reynolds? Yeah, I don't know if I have much more to say about Ray Milland. I mean, you know, obviously, uh, The Lost Weekend is the film he's most known for, which uh, came right after this one. Um, 
and so I, it's clear that you know he can give really strong performances. Um, that I just don't think that this was it, but. Um, it's still, I mean, he does fine in this one. I mean, and then, you know, he did a crossover and went to Hitchcock for Dialogue for Murder. Right, right. Uh, Ten years later. So, I mean, uh, you know, I enjoy watching Ray Land. I think that uh, there's something interesting about him. He's never been um, like somebody that I've sought out to kind of see more of, but I always enjoy him when he's in stuff. I agree. Uh, but speaking of enjoying while in stuff... <laughs> <laughs> Marjorie Reynolds uh, plays Carla Hilfe. Uh, she's uh, she is um, this is another one of those name changes. Anna in the book, uh, she is uh, the sister in uh, uh, the movie. She's the love interest in the book, uh. um, and that's that's another interesting twist. She's also much more of a of an implied. I'm not sure if it's explicitly outed, but she's an implied conspirator uh, and a Nazi in the book. Um, so it. That's my understanding, at least. So, what'd you think of uh, Marjorie? I, I mean, I like her. I, I don't know if I had seen her in anything else. Yes, um, you have, you liar. I have seen her in Holiday Inn, which I've never seen. You are you are a broken man. What? You but haven't you know, seen she, Holiday Inn? She was in three episodes of Leave It to Beaver, so maybe you I probably- have seen her. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. Yes. No, I've never seen Holiday Inn. It's uh, one that I've never, I don't know, I kind of missed it. And then, yeah, I just, I, you know, I hear there's some some very difficult uh, musical numbers to get through. And so I've just never kind of bothered with it. It, it has some really significant low points, that movie. And yet, uh, it is one of those that can't help but make you smile on the uh, the high points. So, yeah, there you go. Despite her, her illustrious career, of which I, I know not much... Um, I uh, I still enjoy her in this film. I think that uh, she brings, I mean, it does feel very kind of 40s um, romance sort of sensibility to the film as far as, you know, uh, seeing Stephen Neal and instantly kind of falling in love with him, that whole thing. Um, that felt very of the time in the story. But there was something very sweet about her. And I actually really enjoyed the element of her and her brother together, um, and then her brother ends up being the spy. I thought that was an interesting twist that I, I really didn't see coming. And then once I find out that he's the spy, I did start questioning her. And so, you know, I thought that was kind of an interesting place that it put my um, my noggin, despite the fact that it doesn't end with uh, any suspicion toward her. Well, and I'm right with you on that. And I think that was a nice twist, right? Giving us the sense of tension between this this sort of familial tension that there was the the sibling betrayal, I think adds another layer that that is um, it's a good layer. It's a fun layer. It's an it's a layer of intensity. And and uh, you know, I don't know. I. This is one of those relationships that I can. I found myself thinking, I, I sure would love to see this played out in in the hands of today's filmmakers. Uh, I think it would be much more interesting to watch uh, that sibling relationship break down in a way that could be portrayed in, in a little bit um, deeper, maybe um, more sinister fashion. Does that make me a bad person? I don't have any siblings, so maybe I, that makes me a bad person. Yes. I wonder why you don't have any siblings <laughs> anymore. Mm. Wait, what? That's right. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. No, I, you know, I do like um, this relationship, and I think there is something. I'm wondering if it was um, designed by Miller purposefully this way um, that. Carla ends up killing her brother, making her kind of the logical pairing for Neil, who had killed his wife. Like now they've both killed um, somebody they love. That's yeah. a really good point. I hadn't made that. To find find a way to kind of, they can help each other heal. You know? Yeah, I hadn't made that connection. That's great. Everybody's yeah. killing spouses and partners. <laughs> That's right. Just just for the healing. Just for the it's fun of it. Therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any siblings? <laughs> Uh, what about Carl Esmond? Carl uh, um, Willie Eichenberger. I like him. I think that there's something so likable about this character. And I think there's something smart about casting somebody who's just so stinking likable in a role like this. And even <sighs> right up to the end, he's just so likable. You know, when he's having his final conversation, I really like you. Uh, just whatever he's saying, I, I thought it was great. I, I really enjoyed him. He's uh, he's Austrian, and I think that um, he brought a that, a little bit of that sensibility um, to the role. Just I mean, I could kind of feel that uh, 
I don't know, his accent, I guess, maybe I bought a little more than Marjorie's. I, I found myself real. I mean, this is a charismatic dude. Yes. Uh, he was just fantastic. And going back and forth between playing the friend and the confidant and the sis, the, the brother uh, to the ultimate betrayer in the film, I thought he pulled it off in just aces, absolutely aces. Um, I, he was uh, he, of note, uh, apart from his role in, you know, opposite classic, terrific studio film uh, uh, film players like Errol Flynn and Gary Cooper and and uh, uh, Susan Hayward and Gregory Peck. I mean, he's been with all of them. He lived to a hundred and two. Dang. Yeah, right. I don't. I don't know a whole. I can't think of a whole lot of actors that that cross the the hundred mark. Uh, they, you know. Particularly, you make it through these the, the, the hard drinking days, the hard drugging days. Uh, you end up uh, you end up dead. Yeah, uh, Gloria Stewart was a hundred when she passed away. Yeah, well, she was like I pretty said, close. Yeah, pretty close. Not on the heels of Carl. Yeah, that's amazing. Anyhow, well, yeah, he's definitely charismatic, and uh, he was certainly a high point in this film. Yeah, absolutely. Who Much else? Like Hillary Brooke, I I really love her as as Mrs. Belaine. There's something just so off-putting about this woman who's just so casual about everything and it's just like yeah you you can take the bullets out of my gun you know and just like she does this seance and the way that that seance was lit first of all i mean it was just gorgeously lit it was a beautiful scene to watch and she just seemed like the perfect person to kind of run it um i really like her in this film um despite the fact that it's one of those parts that i'm like i don't know if i fully get it but I'm okay with that because I. Just why Why don't you fully get it? What is What is missing from that part for you? Well, it's just like what is the point of this this seance? And it seems like they set this whole thing up. I mean, she says, "Oh well, we knew who you were. I have my people working behind the scenes to feed me all the information or whatever it was." And they, you know, they they play the whole seance as if they're communicating with Neil's um, wife's spirit. Um, which is it's so strange really that they, ridiculous that, that that's the the way they choose to go with this and then the whole fake murder and everybody's in on it and uh, in, you know none of it really made sense and then he runs into her at um one of the other uh, people's uh houses he goes over to a house of one of the other people the seance and uh, mrs belaine is there and they just have this casual conversation and it's just i don't know it's just it's like, I don't know how bad she is. If if she's completely bad, is she just kind of playing along with everything? I don't get it, but I like it. <laughs> so <laughs> I may not know art, but I know what I like. <laughs> well, there you go. I agree. How about, uh, how about old Percy Warham as Inspector Prentice? What I like about him is that Lang makes you feel like he's the bad guy uh, right out of the gate. And even when you find out that he works for Scotland Yard, he still is portrayed like he's the bad guy. That last <laughs> shot of him walking up the stairs after he's killed the Nazis in the stairwell, it's like he's still like walking slowly and he's like dressed in all black and he, he almost emerges like a vampire out of his crypt. It's like, what is what are they doing here? What is Lang saying about this inspector? I have no idea, but it was just it was really interesting. Uh, now, if there's anybody who deserved to be shot and stay shot, it's... Uh... It's Cork Travers, the tailor. Dan Durier. Cost, not Cork. Cost. Cost uh, or Travers, the tailor. He is, uh, he, man, is he uh, typically just, uh, what a guy we just love to hate. He's just as, uh, uh, well, I'd say he's worse than Scarlet Street. I mean, he's really, he is really just an evil, evil yes. guy in Scarlet Street. Um, here, it's just such an interesting character because we first see him popping up at the uh, at the fet right at the very beginning of the film he's yes. the guy who is supposed to have picked up this cake um, and then of course he's the one who gets fake shot at the seance and then it turns out that he's Travers the tailor um, sending spy information in the seams of of suits <laughs> it's just I don't know it's so <laughs> silly but uh, again it's just something I love this is Dan's first of three films he's going to do with Fritz Lang and he gets the uh, fantastic Langian suicide in this film of stabbing himself to death with the most gigantic pair of scissors I've ever seen yes <laughs> ridiculous. Like ridiculous Ridic and he he dials the phone with them like right. Edward freaking scissor hands yeah it's it, it, so stupid He's really off-putting. He is just so off-putting. <laughs> yes, it's really bad. 
Uh, but you know, I and and you're right. He wasn't. He certainly wasn't Scarlet Street anno- uh, bad here. But he was annoying, and I think that is a that is a character trait that he really uh, Dandria uh, has has cultivated in many of his films. And I think he was he was you know he this was a character that he he could wear pretty easily. Uh, I mean, I, I think typically he would be kind of more the gangster sorts of characters. Right. Um, but there's something here that has that kind of under it's it's almost like all of that is kind of you know the subtext that his character is uh, is is putting off and i like that what do you think of uh, of dr forrester alan napier alan napier you know i it wasn't until after when i started looking up information but i didn't recognize him as uh the uh, uh alfred the butler on on batman uh and i didn't I, either until i looked too did, i'm like oh yeah yeah, it, he was he was a little bit of a chameleon in this film. I thought he was uh, I thought he was great as Doctor Forrester. I I did not recognize him. I didn't have that sense of warmth. Oh, the oh, how nice to see him in this film. I didn't pick him no. up at all. No, I didn't either. Um, but when I looked him up, it was great to see. Oh, he's uh, Alfred on the Batman TV series. Oh, look at all these voices that he did in Disney films. You know, Sword in the Stone and uh, and uh, Mary Poppins. And I mean, he was just a, a voice in a lot of these things. And then you know, he just popped up all over the place. So he's just one of those guys who's just super busy in a lot of things. Finally, uh, Erskine Sanford as. Uh... George Rennett. Yeah, his bit is uh, pretty small in this. Just kind of the uh, the initial detective that uh, that Neil hooks up with. Um, but I love you know right out of the gate he's kind of secretly drinking his booze, and I love when he pours the booze uh, to share with Neil, and he pours just a few drops in a cup for Neil, and <laughs> like <laughs> half the cup for himself. That was fantastic. Yeah, that um, was really good. Yeah, he uh, he pops up in a lot of Orson Welles's films, so. I don't, in fact, I don't know if I've seen him in anything else other than Orson Welles' films, but uh, it's nice to see him popping up here. We've already talked about some of the issues that, around getting this film made and the production. Uh, what have we missed? This was a Paramount film, all of their team, and Lang had to kind of adapt and kind of roll with the punches to get this thing made. Um, e- even though he did go nine days over schedule and about $44,000 over budget, but Miller really kind of, uh, you know, he was apparently kind of drowning Lang in memos and making him kind of do everything that he asked. And uh, Lang knew he is the producer. He's got the studio behind him. So the studio is going to side with him. Yeah, that was, uh, that's unfortunate for a number of parties, uh, ultimately. But uh, again, a, a fine film that could have been much better. Uh, what did you think of the uh, cinematography of the good Henry Sharp? That's good. I mean, you look at that seance scene, very nicely lit. I, I think that they... Um, uh, even if Sharp wasn't his first choice, I think they still worked well together to capture a very noirish atmosphere, and I I found it uh, really you know, it just it was very uh, pleasantly uh, shadowy to look at. It was, and there was some interesting stuff. I mean, you know, some particularly I, I think about the um, the books the bookstore right in the uh-huh. bookshop. Uh, that is a sequence that I think highlights what happens throughout this film in a novel way that it is visually compressing uh using the just the way the camera just slowly dollies in uh it makes it feel like the the um, the walls are kind of crumbling around you, you know, like they're moving in on you, on, on our, our characters here as they're in hideout. And I think that that use of compressing space, I think is, it, it makes for a, um, a nice visual pairing to what they're already doing, right? They're, they're already just trying to hide. They're trying to be small. And I think so many of the spaces that are otherwise quite large, uh, another example of the the, uh, the bomb shelter as they go underground, that is a very large space that is made to feel uh, highly compressed through the use of so many other bodies, but also just where they put the camera so low to the floor uh, and and so on, that I think it it works really, really well. And so, um, you know, yeah, it doesn't quite match Lang's other films, but, uh, you know, does it serve the material? Absolutely it does. I agree. I think it uh, fits well in the context of the story that's being served here and uh, yeah no i think he does a fine job i mean it may have caused uh, issues with lang but you know I-, I think that lang still got out of him um a very solid project production design uh, hans dreyer and hal perea yeah set decoration by bertram granger 
Uh, Hans uh, started with uh, Joseph von Sternberg early on in his career. And man, you look at his uh, credits. I mean, Sunset Boulevard, Double Indemnity. He's a guy who's been around. And I mean, 537 uh, credited films that uh, IMDb has for him. And then Hal Pereira, uh, 275 credited films. So, I mean, clearly these guys are busy, busy guys. I, I wonder, looking at the credits, if this falls into the uh, the category of, uh, like the guy we, uh, in With the Wizard the, of Oz the episode. the thousand credits. Right, yeah. who, who gets, it gets, you know, uh, contractual credits on everything the studio puts out. Yeah. Makes me wonder. Let's see, uh, costumes, how do they feel? Edith Head? You know, I don't know. Uh, the costumes felt fine to me. Uh, nothing really stood out as uh, anything too special i think some of the dresses were pretty nice i thought for uh for marjorie and uh and for our other ladies in the film but um you know edith head i think is just one of those costume designers that is such a a key part of the film industry and and worked so well with um so many filmmakers i mean geez she won eight oscars had you know tons of nominations just one of those people that's just um uh, kind of a, a, a keystone in the industry. And so um, I don't know if I have anything specific to say other than the fact that Edith, Edith Head did the costumes here. And, uh, you know, she is a marvel in her uh, field. All right. Music, Victor Young. I like it. I think the music works fine. It has kind of a dark feel. It it does kind of feel a little noirish. So I think Victor Young's score is fine here. Another, I, I believe, uh, a Paramount fella. I can't. Uh, I can't place it. I can't, I couldn't hum you the tune, but my recollection of watching it is it, it felt very uh, um, noirish and kind of plodding along, kind of like the clock ticking along. Uh, how did it do in terms of awards? Uh, did it uh, perform at all? Not in the world of awards, no. Well, this was a short segment. You know, I, I do want to say that um, this is one of those films, it was kind of funny to put it on because the first thing that popped up was the Universal logo followed by the Paramount logo. And, you know, this happens from time to time when you're watching a movie and you keep getting these different studio logos. It's like, who is controlling this film? This was one of those films. There were uh, like around 700 some films that Paramount had made um, that in the days of TV, when they didn't, you know, didn't know what to do with any of their product anymore, they sold their films uh, to MCA Universal for TV distribution back in 1958. And Universal has had control of them ever since. And it's just one of those things where I think that uh, studios didn't really have a sense of where things were going and were a lot more willy-nilly with things like this, and not to mention chucking them or you know letting them catch fire or whatever. I mean, they were just not very careful with stuff, and hence, the reason that we have these restoration companies trying to uh, preserve what they have left. Um, but yeah, this is one of those things where I think uh, Paramount probably re- has some regret about uh, the fact that they no longer control or make money from some of the films that they uh, put out there. We've done now five films uh, of Lang uh, over the course of this series, uh, just a little over a month talking about some of the big films that he has done. But I think overall we've talked about in Lang a... I don't know if it's a wider stretch of his films than any other particular director, writer that we've talked about on the show before, but certainly one of the most dramatic. I don't think we've ever talked about anyone else that, that you know, over the, the transom of silent films to sound films. And for me, that conversation has been the most interesting because I think we've seen him develop as a filmmaker uh, you know, in in a much more vibrant and dramatic way than than others that we've talked about on the show. What do you think? The, yeah, there's something about um, him as a filmmaker. I think you're right. We, I mean, we had never talked about any silent films in the show before. So, you know, he, by benefit of that, we are talking about um, him during the silent and sound era, and then all the way up into the 40s. So we actually see a pretty good stretch of his uh, films and kind of the uh, the way that he transitioned from. Germany to Hollywood. And I mean, having talked about Scarlet Street in our noir series, you know, getting a hint on where he goes with the noir and the darker tones, which fit so well for him. We've had a nice glimpse into his his career. And I think that he's an interesting filmmaker to talk about over this particular stretch that we've covered because 
of his uh, his kind of place in in the world and how he actually was a German filmmaker who fled the Nazis and ended up uh, in Hollywood making anti-Nazi films. And I think that was an interesting um, an interesting element in his life. I also think it's interesting that, you know, he had this story about how he escaped Germany that you relayed early on in the series and how uh, Goebbels kind of uh, offered him the role of the head of their film um, industry, basically. Um, it seems like after... Uh, he passed away, people were looking more into uh, digging more into his life and kind of uncovered that that may not be completely true, that it seemed like Lang um, did have maybe a conversation with Goebbels, but continued kind of going in and out of Germany for for months as he was kind of getting stuff. It didn't seem like there was anybody after him. And so it made people question, you know, was this really something of an escape for him? What was really going on? And it, it kind of painted in people's minds, maybe Lang kind of uh, was kind of creating this uh, this portrait of himself in Hollywood on purpose to kind of give people this sense that he was this uh, this anti-nazi guy and sure I mean he he did leave he didn't stick with the Nazis but it was almost as if you know I mean he's marketing himself this guy who kind of created this image of himself as this anti-nazi guy who escaped Germany to kind of help get a better foothold in Hollywood. So it's interesting that uh, that this is uh, kind of the world that this guy came from, and this is kind of the way that he ended up selling himself to the industry to uh, kind of find a new track for himself, which we kind of have been exploring. He is nothing if not calculated. Absolutely. And and I you know, I think that really goes to this you know, to the questioning his his escape from from Nazi Germany and uh you know, I'm I saw the same thing that you know the the reports of his escape have been uh, greatly exaggerated how many times he went back into Germany specifically for, you know, money for his because his a lot of his wealth was still in Germany and he was able to go in and out fairly freely uh, is is how the story goes. That's one of the things you mentioned early on that he was going to be that there's a movie about him coming out and I think it's one of the things that I'm looking most forward to after we've talked about all these films is to to see some of that research clarify um, because, you know, not necessarily that it will change my opinion about the films, but it certainly will change my, uh, you know, will impact my opinion about the guy. Um, he is, he, he, everything I have read about them about him is he is, he is an exceptional filmmaker and not a good person. You're definitely abusive toward his actors. And um, he was one of those guys that even if he ended up um, kind of having a fling or, or, you know, hooking up with one of his actresses, he still treated them poorly. Yeah. He's one of those guys who knew what he wanted and did everything he needed to do in order to get what he wanted. Except when, like, he was in this position, like, on this particular film where the producer wouldn't let him. And he turned it into a situation where he's just like, oh, I hate that. I hate that one. But, you know, despite all of that, I found that um, even if it's a film that I don't completely love, like Manhunt... I really have fun watching his films. Like, he knows how to put a movie together. And, uh, I mean, going through this series, I'm like, you know, I am captivated by what Lang brings to the table in his films. And I I feel like he's a director that I actually want to go back and kind of explore his filmography a little bit more. I think that there's probably a lot of really interesting stuff in there. I absolutely agree on that point. And on that, Andy, you should tell us how this one did. Well, as you know, I've had a real struggle <laughs> with... <laughs> with many of these Lang films finding much information. But I did find a, a tiny hint of information on this one in his uh, biography. This film was released October 16th, 1944. And uh, it had a budget initially of about $700,000. And like I said, he went over about 44000 So about 744000 for the budget for this film. That brought it to, in today's dollars, about nine point eight million dollars for the budget so you know a small studio film that i think he cranked out here i think he did a good job um that's all the information i have i don't have any information as to how much it made but um i think it was a film that uh that still did uh, well enough to be kind of remembered in history as as a, a minor work of fritz lang it's something andy you did good work on this one you don't ever sell yourself <laughs> short <laughs> I, I was hoping I would get to explore the Reich Mark to uh, dollar <laughs> conversion a little bit more, but alas, just once. <laughs> no, no. Let's rank it. 
Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel and you'll jump right to our our profile there and you you can just click on it. It should be, if you're doing this in any sort of timely fashion, we should just be right in the recently uh, added. Isn't there like a recently added thing on there? Yeah, the yeah. last four films. Right? Last four films. You, if you're doing this in the last four weeks, you click on, on Ministry of Fear. It's right there. You don't even have to search. You just click on it. It's right there. And then you can do like we do, like Andy's about to do right now and tell us, Ministry of Fear versus... First up, you know what it is. It's the O Brother block. Ministry of Fear or O Brother, where art thou? I'm, I'm O Brother, clearly. Yeah, I am too. Ministry of Fear or The Host? I'm actually Ministry of Fear on this one. I'll give you Ministry of Fear on this one. Ministry of Fear or King's Row? King's or Row. Ronnie Reagan. I'm going to do Ministry of Fear. How serious are you? I'm serious. But but Ronnie, he was oh, all laid up in bed. Where's the rest of me? <laughs> all right, forget it. I'm giving it to you. <laughs> that was enough. <laughs> Ministry of Fear or a League of Their Own? I'm Tom sure. Hanks I'm takes sure it for me. you are a League of Their Own. Oh yes, I will be a League of Their Own too. All right, Ministry of Fear or Syriana? I am Syriana. Syriana, yeah. Ministry of Fear or uh, what's up, Doc? I'm going to go with Ministry. What's up, Doc? Ministry of Fear for me. Okay, I, uh, how serious are you? I'm I'm serious enough. All right, well, we're going to have to uh, do a little Rochambeau here. Let's do it. All right, one, one two, two, three, three scissors. Paper. Oh, man. That's, that's twice in a row. It really is. That was just a stunning performance on my part, if I do yeah, say I know. so. Myself. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Ministry of Fear <laughs> or Field of Dreams. I am Field of Dreams. I am. Do I even want to risk it? I really am Ministry of Fear. Well, let's do it. All right. Okay. One, One two, two, three. three. Scissors. Oh, I thought he was second guessing, so I'll second guess, and then we'll second guess, and then I'll win in second guessing. Never go in against a Sicilian when death is on the line. So unrelated to this conversation, but there you go. Ministry of Fear or Infernal Affairs. I'm doing Infernal Affairs. I uh, Definitely. All right, we are at 150. 150. 150. That's yeah, pretty that's, good. That is pretty good. So we've talked about six Fritz Lang films. Um, the first one up is actually Scarlet Street. That's the highest ranked on our list, which I think is definitely, in my mind, uh, that is my favorite of his Absolutely. films. Absolutely. Um, that followed by M, then Ministry of Fear as number three. Then we have Spies, followed closely, hot on the heels by Metropolis, ending with Manhunt. And does that feel good to you? That feels good to me. Yeah, that feels pretty good to me. Me too. That feels I mean, that feels right on. Yeah. All right. And, and now it's time for the big reveal, Andy. Oh, I know. It's the star rating. You said, I believe, what did you say that I was going to uh, give this? I week? guessed, didn't I say three stars? Yes, you did, Andy. Yeah. In fact... This is a three-star movie, Andy. Congratulations. Wow. Yeah. What prize do I get? All the ponies. I guess I got to keep my life savings. You get it. <laughs> <laughs> Phew. Yeah. That was close. That was a big, was a big uh, risk for me. Yeah, it's a strong three. <laughs> strong three. Well, I am at three and a half. It feels like I am the curmudgeon on this thing. Every week, you've been a half star higher than me. Doesn't it feel yeah. like that? Yeah, I'm, I'm a lover, Pete. Man, you really are. What can I say? All right. I give and I give and I give. Well, this is the um, this is the uh, the end of our Fritz Lang series. Where pray tell do we go from here? As you uh, as you know, we did our listeners' choice drawing not too long ago, and Michael Cook was the winner. And we are talking about the Great Escape, so that is our next film. We're going to be doing listeners' choice episode, followed by our two vacation challenge episodes: Paranorman and Doctor Strange Love, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying. And love the bomb. And right before that, we're going to hook up uh, with uh, JJ and the crew uh, for a film board episode we're going to be talking about now. You see me too. Oh my goodness. Yes, it's uh, interesting that we're subjecting ourselves to that one after not being big lovers of the first one. But I think it'll be interesting to see if they do anything better with this one. I... Plus, a little uh, Gem in the Holograms uh, action because uh, same director. 
makes me excited. Yeah, excited. I know. I really, yeah, I really was noting that. <laughs> really, <laughs> noted that really hard. <laughs> oh my man, that was good. Uh, you, you know, I'm so we're we've got a busy season coming up, so I I better go to bed. All right, I'm going to keep a lookout. I think our friend with the fingernails might come back. Amazon, Andy. Amazon giveth. As Amazon always doeth. I can't believe that I got the only one star. Only one. The, there no was two only stars. one star. Yeah, and no two stars, which is really strange. And that the only one star is not about the quality of the DVD. <laughs> right. Right? And so it's stunning. And so I offer it here. This is from John, uh, and he watched this film in 2013 on DVD. I love Criterion, says John. I love noir, and I certainly love Fritz Lang. Manhunt, his edge-of-your-seat film uh, film of Jeffrey Household's Man Who Wants to Assassinate Hitler, still raises my pulse rate. So why didn't I like Lang's Ministry of Fear? Ray Milland makes a very weak hero. His motivations, admittedly diluted from the Graham Greene novel on which the film is based, are murky and not exactly sympathetic. The motivations of his female companion, Marjorie Reynolds, are equally vague and uninteresting. Criterion's print is crisp. (laughs) Can you believe it? He's actually calling out how great the print is. (laughs) Lang's direction is not. The only time there's any suspense comes when the Milan Reynolds team take refuge in the shadows on a glistening rooftop hiding from the gunman. Nazis? But then the lids, my lids slid down and I slumped against my pillow. I hope Ray extricated himself from his wartime problems. For myself, I could care less. And, and by John, and by that, I think he means that he couldn't care less. Because in fact, he maybe if he could care less... He actually liked it. Maybe he means he would have given it zero if he could have. Oh, that's a good point. That's a noble point. I'll yeah. give you, I'll, I, I will cede that point to you. Well, I've got a three star uh, by J.F. Leslie, who uh, says, style to burn, but little substance. Lacks the poignancy and heartache of the Graham Greene novel, but it's cleverly shot and edited. Dan Durier, a Western bad guy, gamely attempts to play a British bad guy. Not a lot here, but I did like that, you know, at least this person had read the novel and gave us a a little bit of a comparison about it. And, uh, you know, lacking the poignancy and heartache. I mean, like you said about Graham Greene um, and his books, I mean, there's something about kind of what he brings to them. And, you know, I I actually was curious to pick this one up and read it after I saw this movie. It's a bit of a tough find. Well, you can buy used copies. I'd have to actually buy a used copy. Yeah, I just... yeah. (laughs) Dead, That's not dead, a Kindle. Dead tree books? What? Doesn't that make me dirty? Who does that? All the viruses and diseases. Oh, uh, dear. Thanks, Amazon. It is hard to believe we have been having in-depth conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. Season 5 had some great adaptations, like our Meryl Streep Oscar-nominated performances series. We covered adaptations like Kramer vs. Kramer, Sophie's Choice, and The French Lieutenant's Woman. It's a real Sophie's Choice between those books. (laughs) <laughs> you see what I see what I did there? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I don't think it's quite at the level of a real Sophie's Choice. We also did Snowpiercer for our Bong Joon-ho series, adapted from the French graphic novel Le Transpersonnage. Man, I love that movie. We had our two-part 1939 series that included adaptations like Gone with the Wind, Ninochka, The Women, and The Hound of the Baskervilles. A number of those 1939 movies, like Goodbye, Mr. Chips, also tied into our recent 1940 Academy Award Best Picture nominee series. Our naughty children horror series had creepy adaptations like The Bad Seed, Village of the Damned, The Innocents, and Children of the Corn. For our Hayao Miyazaki series, we talked about his take on Lupin the Third with the Castle of Cagliostro, plus his own The Wind Rises. 
Some great listener choice picks, too. Viridiana and The Great Escape. And for our David Mamet Wright series, The Verdict, The Untouchables, and Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Plus, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang from our Shane Black series, adapted from Brett Halliday's novel, Bodies Are Where You Find Them. Dive into the sources for all of these at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support the show. Check out thenextreel.com slash originals today and find your next read. Oh,